should I should we kick this off? I can give an introduction for for those who don't who don't know um, our our distinguished uh, you know Flannery O'Connor expert. Well, that would okay, be well, that would be Alex Hadley. <laughs> Sorry, I'm still a little bit frazzled from the from the from the from the Zoom fiasco, so I'm just kind of like recovering my senses here. But uh, but Alex and I are are uh, are good friends from high school, and uh, and then from the Heights, and then Alex went to Notre Dame. You did Greek and Greek Latin in the Great Books program there, and now you're teaching Northridge, and. Um, and uh, yeah, I know you like Flannery O'Connor, and we had we've been talking a good bit about her in the house. And then we thought we'd have a little little discussion, and uh, and then cue in anybody else who wanted to who wanted to join. So yeah, I don't know if anyone has any sort of good lead off questions, but uh, this was my first exposure to Flannery O'Connor, and I guess it was as weird as everyone warned it warned me it would be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a strange one. It's a very, very strange one. Uh, I think this was one of her last stories, which in, in, a, in a way was like kind of seen, it's been seen by like critics as a little bit of a culmination of her work in various ways. Um, I guess actually, so I, yeah, I'm not totally sure how we want to do this. So if people can unmute themselves, I think. I don't know if there's gonna be that much background noise, but um, I had like, subtopics that I wanted to talk about. And then I have questions connected to each one. Now to a certain extent, it's like my observations. But um, I love if other people kind of like chimed in and almost like explain the kind of topic as it is. Um, Daniel, are you okay with me like kind of getting started on one on one specific kind of subtopic? Yeah, I think that's great. Oh, you gotcha. Well, so Daniel mentioned that um, I like Flannery O'Connor a lot. I do like Flannery O'Connor a lot. I've probably read like nine stories of hers. So I haven't actually read like that much. And I haven't read her letters extensively. I've read a couple and then I, my sisters have told me a lot about her letters. Um, the person I'm really interested in, and so I'm going to kind of piggyback this, is another Southern Catholic author named Walker Percy, who you may have heard of. He did some kind of very strange novels that tend to be very boring. Uh, for a very specific reason, but like the movie goer, um, love in the ruins, yeah, Thanatos syndrome. They they have kind of these really interesting names, and they kind of sound like they're going to be super interesting, but they're actually quite boring. Um, but then he does some philosophical works, which are the ones that I like, and they are extraordinarily interesting. So he uses Flannery O'Connor a lot um, as an example of what he's discussing. So actually, I saw a lot of connections between this story and some of his key ideas. So the first kind of topic that I wanted to like think about, and I think it came up very well in the first few pages of the story, is this idea of ennui or like um, existential boredom and how it plagues Parker um, in a very striking way. On so like three or four pages in. I saw this uh, quote, it's right when he sees the man at the fair who's covered in tattoos. Um, and he just kind of stares at him and he sees all these like men and beasts and flowers on his skin rippling. And uh, if you guys see this paragraph, it says, Parker had never before felt the least motion of wonder in himself. Until he saw the man at the fair, it did not enter his head that there was anything out of the ordinary about the fact that he existed. Um, I thought this was super, super interesting because then he, he directly connects tattoos to all of a sudden something being interesting in his life before everything else is just emptiness and ordinariness, but in maybe the most depressing way possible, the ordinariness of his life. Um, that's something Walker Percy talks a lot about, like the 20th century being kind of the century of ennui. People wandering about, doing lots of things, but just being profoundly bored with their own lives. Um, in fact, there's actually one chapter in one of his books, which I was really struck by with this, because Walker Percy, his own parents, I think his father committed suicide, his brother committed suicide, his mother maybe committed suicide, like unclear. 
and he has this really profound chapter where he talks about um, like it's a, it's kind of a strange chapter, but he almost wants us to like think about what committed suicide would would be like as a way of saying only when you've considered what it would be like to not exist can you really appreciate what it is to exist. And then you get this very full appreciation of life. He himself suffered from depression in his own life. And this was his kind of way of like, part of the way of breaking free of the ennui of life is like, well, think about what it means not to exist. And then only then can you appreciate what it means to exist. So I was really struck by the fact that Parker kind of like, before that, nothing kind of like mattered to him. Um, and then I was also struck that even then after that, even with the tattoos, he kind of seems to float through life. Um, I don't know what you guys thought about that. Like, well, well, so I don't know. What, do you guys have any thoughts on what was the source of his disquiet? Um, what was the source of kind of like his extreme boredom with life? And then even with uh, the dissatisfaction that they talk about. And also, like, is it specific to his sin? Um, Sorry, the, the last thing you said, is it a specific to what? To his setting. Like, who we, like uh, where he's set. Like, he's obviously kind of, he's almost like white trash in the South. Mm-hmm. We don't know much about his past, right? His uh, his childhood, uh, up to the moment when he sees this man with the tattoos, right? Yeah, we don't know almost anything. Um, we know his mother is like a Bible-beating Southern Protestant. It seems like she tries to take him to that church, and kind of nothing comes of it, and he flees. Um, one, of, one of the most interesting kind of like manifestations of it that I thought were, were his interactions with women in general and kind of how he seemed to pride himself on like being able to um, basically seduce women and that was like his way of getting rid of the boredom mm -hmm. like the scene where he meets his wife and he fakes the hand injury in order to like get her attention or how he constantly is talking about um, to his wife about how he works for this hefty blonde when in fact she's like an old lady. And it seemed to me like that was his way of trying to, to break his own ennui. And yet it's so shallow and I think depressing to read about. Um, I thought that was very, and so I guess with like the sense of disquiet, what Walker versus Anthony Flynn and O'Connor to a certain extent are very concerned with is like a, a breakdown in mores and that's the best way to try expressing this. Well, hmm. Maybe I'll move on to the second thing. Because these two things are intimately connected. Um, another thing that Walker Percy is very concerned with is the idea of self. And uh, so, like, the, you know, the classic Socrates thing is know thyself. And that's kind of like the root of all wisdom. And yet Walker Percy has this whole theory that he almost equates human, abil human ability to... Um, reflect on themselves mm -hmm. as both the, the thing that is distinctly human, but also the thing that is essentially original sin. So no other animal ever thinks like, who am I? Mm -hmm. um, partially because they can't also, they can't kind of choose who they're going to be. And that's where he really sees the problem with humanity is that they have the ability to choose who they are, and that's where you get a lot of 
students coming in there because they misidentify themselves. There's a constant misidentification going on. Um, and I thought particularly with Parker, he uses tattoos as a way of creating a self-identity. So, and, yeah, kind of the next page is the previous. Or, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, it seems like he, he breaks the boredom, right? One, through seducing women. Two, through tattoos. Mm -hmm. uh, tattoos plays into the seducing women. Um, but I don't think there's, there really isn't much else to his character. You know, I mean, up until the end, right? Up until he gets this different tattoo. Um, there isn't really much there, I don't think. Or I guess, Rafa, did you, did you have a point? I think, I think the problem is that he, he's against that parting that you defend of, of what it means to be, to be a human who understands himself and, and does the source of sin. I think that his sins are, instead of fruit of his freedom, it's fruit of a, his impulses. He just, he moves by his desires. It's not that he takes decisions. Parker is like an animal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting how quickly the tattoos lose their effect. Mm -hmm. They tend to last for a month. And then he has to move on to the next one almost immediately. Um, he's there's not no a permanent meaning. Sorry? That he's... He's not a he's not a, a fully a full human being because he's not able to give meaning to things. They they don't last anything in his life. There's nothing that, that satisfies him. He's not able to. He's not mature enough to understand what he's doing. So that to to get the the source like the the essence of a tattoo and enjoy it. No, he keeps he needs more and more. And he doesn't even understand his his actions. He's like I don't know why I'm with this woman. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I got married. Yeah, I mean, I'd be interested to know, Alex, maybe this is one of your topics, but just, so he, he, he goes through life, seduces women, gets tattoos, and he meets a woman that he, that he can't seduce through, through tattoos, and he, and he just can't help himself. He doesn't know why he keeps coming back to her, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yet she seems to reject everything that he is, you know? Um, yet he, he still wants her, right? And he doesn't really know why. And there's, there's, like, there's like no thought process there at all, right? Again, kind of like what Rafa's saying, it's just like an impulse. Um, he's, not, he's not really thinking. Um, and it's all very self-centered too, right? It's vanity of vanities. Um, again, I think that this, that this changes at the end, but it's like up until that point. Uh, yeah, it's just, yeah. But there is something yeah, there's never a problem that on the very first page. He says he could account for her one way or another, but it was himself he could not understand. So like it's pretty easy to kind of like he, he like he thinks he understands Sarah Ruth, but the real the real thing is that he he has he has no idea who he is mm -hmm. and what his real purpose is in life. Um, I thought it was very it's very interesting how he puts all the tattoos were places where he can see them. So the tattoos are very important uh, because only through them does he think he has any kind of meaning. Because only by seeing them can he get any kind of meaning from them but obviously like they aren't and then there's that really sad part where it says the effect was not of one intricate um, arabesque of colors but of something haphazard and botched it's like he thinks he's building this great tapestry of like who he is to the tattoos he's, he's, he's just like he thought painted me, but. it's a i think it's a beautiful metaphor because in the end the tattoos they're covering his skin is through his through his desires that he's covering his own personality, by by just like acting on the basis of his impulses, he's nobody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's he's a dirty a, a dirty picture, of a, of just a a lot of a lot of tattoos put together, that they don't mean anything to anyone but to himself. So it's the first time when he puts a tattoo on his back. That he does some, something for someone else, which is beautiful. That is for the first time that he thinks of someone else. And he's like, all right, I'm going to put it on my back. I'm not going to be able to read it. But this is for my wife. Mm -hmm. But he fails. Did you have a point, Anthony? No, I, I think we're, we're a little harsh on the guy, <laughs> I think. I mean, I think that, yeah, notably. So I really like this idea of identity, right? 
And, um, and I guess, Alex, you start with this question of, like, we don't know much about his background, but we see a little bit. And, and yeah, I guess, like, the idea of fatherhood might, might come in a little bit, right? So there's noticeably a lack of fatherhood um, there in his upbringing. Interestingly enough, in his wife's upbringing, too, right? His, her father is somewhere away preaching. Um, but also, also, you see his mother and his wife a little bit, right? So his, his, his wife is kind of, in a way, maybe a little bit of that identity that he knew growing up. But also with these tattoos, he's trying to find his identity. I mean, I think he's trying to find himself. And he goes to the Navy. He's, he's looking for structure, looking for meaning in different ways. And, and in, the, in the end, I think in the, with the tattoo that he gets for his wife, I think you could say he's looking for a father, right? He's looking for God. And, and he's trying to find it. Um, and maybe in a small way he does. I don't know. What do you guys think? Just one thing to add there, and I I, yeah. didn't, I didn't understand it as reading it. The mention of his wife's pregnancy, I was very confused. I was like, I don't know why she's pregnant right now. But I think that very much goes with the fatherhood, and he's upset at her for being pregnant. Mm. It partially is because, like, I think he yeah he does not understand what fatherhood really is yet because he yeah. never had an example of it in his life, mm-hmm. and that is where a lot of his the crisis of character comes from. Yeah. Rafa, you think Anthony's wrong? <laughs> uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> okay. I, sorry, sorry. I, I should have, I should pray some point in your, in your, <laughs> your, your speech before like refuting it. But I just, I just see that I do not see a search of meaning in his life. Mm. I see answer, answers to spontaneous moves that don't have any meaning, any, any self-consciousness, or any reasoning prior to the action. But Rafa, quick question. What about, okay, so like what, what leads him to get that final tattoo though? I don't know. So like he like, burn, he like runs a tractor into a tree, right? It starts to burn. And then- but That's I the guess, thing. Yeah, and then he just runs and he gets, like why does he choose that tattoo, you know? So do you know why I, I don't have the answer to that? Because Parker doesn't either. <laughs> and in the story, he doesn't even know why he got that. So that's why we, the, the readers, we cannot know either. Because he's a man that doesn't know what he's doing. Okay, I guess what is Flannery Connor trying to tell us then with that last tattoo? Yeah, a tattoo of Christ's face on his back for his wife, right? I mean, I think the... The fact that he doesn't know why he's getting the tattoo is important. And I think it speaks to kind of the, I mean, yeah, I was struck by that, especially reading this, because, yeah, the, the way I kind of always remember the story is like, oh, he has this wife who has tattoos. At the end, he gets a tattoo of Jesus. She doesn't recognize it as Jesus. And that's obviously a sim- simplified version of the story, because even after he gets that t- tattoo, he goes to the bar, he starts a big fight. There's a Jonah reference, which is super interesting. And then even he kind of goes back to her a little bit self-righteous, like, look at it, which obviously is not like a full conversion kind of. Um, But there is kind of this like God works in mysterious ways and like the, the road for his conversion, like this was only the first step Um, or that he's going to have to kind of figure it out a little bit from here. Um, so actually there was, well, so first of all, the crashing of the tractor, Daniel, I have told you this before, would you be able to read that out? Cause I think that's just, I mean, it is the conversion moment, right? So, uh, if you could read that, do a little short dramatic reading and then we can discuss, but yeah, let me, let me, let me, let me pull it up. I think I, ha- I have it. Okay. Two or th- two or three mornings later, he was baling hay with the old woman Sori Baylor and her broken down tractor in a large field. 
cleared save for one enormous old free standing or enormous old tree standing in the middle of it. The old woman was the kind who would not cut down a large old tree just because it was large and old. She had pointed it out to Parker as if he hadn't had any, sorry, she had pointed it out to Parker as if he hadn't, as if he didn't have eyes and told him to be careful not to hit it as the machine picked up hay near it. Parker began at the outside of the field and made circles inward toward it. He had to get off the tractor every now and then and untangle the bailing cord or kick a rock out of the way. The old woman had told him to carry the rock to the edge of the field, which he did when she was there watching. When he thought he could make it, he ran over them. As he circled the field in, the, in his mind was a suitable design for his back. The sun, the size of a golf ball, began to switch regularly from in front to behind him, but he appeared to see it both places as if he had eyes in the back of his head. All at once, he saw the tree reaching out to grasp him. A ferocious thud propelled him into the air, and he heard himself yelling in an unbelievably loud voice, God above. He landed on his back while the tractor crashed upside down into the tree and burst into flames. The first thing Parker saw were his shoes, quickly being eaten by the fire. One was caught under the tractor, the other was some distance away, burning by itself. He was not in them. He could feel the hot breath of the burning tree on his face. He scrambled backward, still sitting, his eyes cavernous, and if he had known how to cross himself, he would have done it. His truck was on a dirt road at the edge of the field. He moved toward it, still sitting, still backward, but faster and faster. Halfway to it, he got up and began a kind of forward bent run from which he collapsed on his knees twice. His legs felt like the old rusted rain gutters. He reached the truck finally and took off in it, zigzagging up the road. He drove past his house on the embankment and straight for the city 50 miles distant. Parker did not allow himself to think on the way to the city. He only knew that there had been a great change in his life, a leap forward into a worse unknown, and that there was nothing he could do about it. It was for all intents accomplished. Okay, a few pages later, as he's... Um going to the uh, tattoo artist for the second day. He doesn't want to keep on talking to the tattoo artist because he keeps on asking him, why are you getting this tattoo? He lay there imagining how Sarah Ruth would be struck speechless by the face on his back. And every now and then, this would be interrupted by a vision of the tree on tree of fire and his empty shoe burning beneath it. Okay. Um, I guess I wanted to use this as for a couple things. First of all, I, the way I see it, I think it's supposed to be burning bush image of him encountering god in some kind of way uh the tree reaching out to grab him is an image that is used multiple times in the rest of the story um the tree's on fire his shoes are off just like moses his shoes are actually on fire or at least one of them is um and then i love how he says god above keeps on saying these words in fact right when he meets her at first he, he lets out a string of um blasphemies but here it's finally it's almost like a yahweh it's like now to the unknowable to like the un unaware nature of it or like he's not fully understanding of it i thought it was really striking when he was lying there and he's kind of thinking a little bit selfishly still like how he's going to kind of show up sarah ruth but then it's interrupted by these musings but no not even by musings. so it's first his selfish musings and then it's interrupted by point um so it's not all about him anymore it's not about creating his own identity instead it's about something else um yeah 
I mean, it's like God reaching down and imprinting, right? I mean, literally imprinting his face on, 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 on Parker. Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought the description of the face was super powerful. First of all, because the, the, the tattoo artist tells him that the most recent stuff is at the back of the book. And he starts there. It's kind of this reflection on like modern times. He's trying to find like a modern Jesus for him. And he sees all these images and none of them really do it for him. And then he gets to some of the oldest images. And it's not like a nice Jesus. Instead, it's this demanding Byzantine Jesus. <laughs> um, and even at the point where he talks about how those eyes, uh, where does he say it? Like they demand everything. Yeah, Parker sat on the ground in the alley. This is after he's been kicked out of the barn, too. So we still see him vacillating between like understanding and not understanding. Um, ex but he examined his soul for like the first time. He saw it, saw it as a spider web of facts and lies that were not at all important to him, but which appeared to be necessary in spite of his opinion. So also like there's this first, like there's an objective truth outside of me that I have to encounter. It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter if I like it or not. Um, and then the eyes that were now forever on his back were eyes to be obeyed. It's like this, I don't know, I just think it's very, very interesting how, like, all of a sudden he seems to kind of have meaning, but obviously he's not totally on board with it, but he recognizes this is, like, this is the Jesus that needs to be obeyed. Um, I don't know if you guys... Yeah, I think, I think this on conviction... That his conviction is interesting. Wait, there's another quote that I wanted to. There's just another part where he talks about. Um, let me, let me, sorry, one second. Uh, I can't find the quote now, but but as far as him sort of being convinced of this, 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 um, voice that he needs to obey, uh, encounter that he feels like, I, I guess I just, I'm just wondering from what comes that conviction? Where, why, why does he have this conviction um, to obey those eyes? And, and, and if I find the quote, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to it. I mean, so I thought the prophet imagery was very interesting for that point. I mean, maybe somebody can think of like a better way of expressing it in terms of like, um, what about the tractor scene would have actually led him to some kind of conversion and therefore a conviction that he needs to change who he is. But to me, it almost seemed just like a direct intervention. Um, Fenrir Connor has this famous quote from her letters where she says, all of my stories were just about grace acting in people's lives, which if you read her stories, you're going to be like, well, that doesn't make any sense because all people in our stories are kind of bad and like they don't really seem to become better very much um if you read a good man it's hard to find it's all about this and also they're not even like really evil people honest parker is one of the most evil <laughs> like in the, a good man is hard to find the kind of the main character who's not who's troubled is this kind of somewhat selfish old grandma but at the very end of the story right before her death um she has this moment where she like stops, she stops all the hypocrisy, all the kind of just putting on for show, the properness, and instead actually becomes like a good Christian woman. Um, but so it seemed to me almost it was like, if you're gonna look for grace in the story, it's like this direct interaction with God who, and you, there's also like a lot of resistance to grace um, that goes on, but it, it doesn't stop, stop the fact that God is still trying that's trying to help Parker somehow, trying to bring him in, um, into the fold. I don't know. Yeah, no, I think that that's, that's, yeah, that's pretty good. I guess one, I mean, kind of like just progressing a little bit, Alex, towards the end of the story, um, I guess, what do you make of his wife's reaction, right? 
or that, that 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 kind of last scene right where he gets there there is this kind of self-righteous attitude he wants to show her he thinks that she's going to be proud and happy and it, there is kind of self-righteous but also he he does he just kind of want it for her she doesn't want to see his back she sees it and that's like immediately dismisses it idolatry uh get out of here that's awful kind of just like the same that she's always been i mean kind of like i mean kind of like nasty too right um not that she doesn't deserve to be nasty, perhaps, because of what Parker's done to her previously, but but he also don't really like the wife either, um, you know. And then he just goes out and cries, and then it's over. And so yeah, he maybe this is like still continuing his conversion. But yeah, I just wanted to see what you thought of that <clears throat> last scene. Well, one thing I thought it just was interesting as I read it over a second time today, but um, that she hits him with a broom, and that was also what she hit him with at the very first time when he when he blasphemed. She whacked him with a broom in that scene as well. Um, so I think I think there was supposed to be like a connection to her. It's like the same thing. Um, yeah, like it's all one thing. Um, I guess. I mean, there's the obvious image of Christ weeping, or uh, well, weeping blood. Really, kind of says there are welts on the tattoo of Christ. Um, and I guess. So Parker used the tattoos to create his own self-identity, and none of them are ever enough. Now, he avoids having a tattoo on his back because then he can't really identify with that necessarily. Um, it seems to me almost like the Christ on his back is supposed to be him stepping outside of himself and being one with Christ. But instead of trying to force Christ to be a part of, like, to, to be who, you know, I don't know exactly how to say it exactly, but like, instead of forcing Christ to conform to who he is, instead he has to have this other thing that is still a part of him is on his back. That kind of thing. And then, so I guess in a way it's like self-identifying with Christ and weeping by the tree um, with a Christ figure weeping on his back. Almost like a, um, like he has, Kind of identify with like almost like the the suffering that Christ has. Now there's also the the tree image, which I thought maybe was Garden of Eden style. And maybe a many of he is finally one with Christ, but also he suffers because of man's sinfulness. Um, like the Garden of Eden tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Um, I thought that the moment when they call how would they call him Obadiah Elihu right at that moment. I thought that that was kind of like affirming him as on the way. They call him by his name there. And his name is obviously heavily biblical. And the two Old Testament, kind of, well, at least from the book of Job, but kind of like prophets. Um, there's a there's a very strong strain of criticism, both in Walker Percy and in Fleming O'Connor, of um, Southern Protestant kind of like, yeah, I mean, actually, Walker Percy is really striking, considering he is a Catholic writer, and he actually calls himself all the time. He says, I'm a Christian novelist, I'm a Christian novelist. He, his kind of two sides to it are always like atheistic rationalists, and um, what does he say? Oh, shoot. Fundamentalist Christian. Sorry, Daniel? Oh, sorry, I was just trying to feed your fundamentalist. Yes, that's actually the word he uses. Yeah, he always says there's always the Christian fundamentalists and then there's the um, there's the atheist scientists. And those are like the two sides of the equation that he thinks of. I think because he see they both see in kind of like the Christian fundamentalist view the same kind of um, I guess I don't, I think they see the same kind of like, I'm not sure if it's, if it's still like a crisis of the self, if it's a crisis of not recognizing what, what God is and who he is, that kind of thing. Um, somehow they've lost their connection completely with God. I'm not sure exactly. Is it when, actually when she first sees it, she doesn't even recognize it as God. She doesn't say, oh, that's idolatry immediately, which is also kind of interesting. He has to say it's God. Uh, her first thing says, she says, him who? 
And he says, God. And she says, God doesn't look like that. He's a spirit. So she's kind of strange. She's like, kind of right. Uh, <laughs> but um, She seemed to have found the word she wanted, vanity of vanities, and she repeats. So she's kind of, it's like almost like a knee-jerk reaction where she's quoting the Bible, but a little bit. Yeah, not even what he's saying. So even though she's correct to call it vanities, she maybe doesn't know where the distinction is or where, they, where it might turn to not vanities. You know, like as Catholics, we all have images of Christ. We don't think those are vanities. Um, actually, I wanted to, sorry, this is like a little bit of a me thing that I just found super interesting. Wait, where did I first encounter this idea? Not sure. I have always thought that one of the most interesting, oh, I know where I encountered it. I think it was in, um, Luther and then also in, uh, Max Weber, talking about the Protestant work ethic. Um, what I find really interesting about the development of Christianity is the emphasis in the Catholic Church on sacraments. And kind of when it comes down to it, what is a sacrament? Um, is this physical sign that allows you to access a much deeper, like a super deep spiritual reality. And that's kind of the fundamental thing that fundamentalist Christians deny. And they reject the kind of physicality of religion. Um, and I thought with this story, even though Parker's, the physical stuff that he's using clearly are vanities of vanities, most of the time, like with the, with the, the eagle and all these things. And in fact, he even talks about how he has some pagan gods or he has some obscenity, that kind of thing. Ultimately, like the physicality of it all is actually not the thing to totally reject. There was like a physical thing that actually brought him to a certain extent salvation. Um, and then also just made me like think about like, why is that so important? Um, I mean, partially because it embraces the whole of the human condition. Like he can't get rid of his body. You almost get the sense Sarah Ruth wants to get rid of her body and eliminate it. I thought that was really interesting. And it's also the physical thing that allows God to interact with him. There's this physical kind of violence that happens, so that the crash, and then through the image, it's only like through those things that he can actually interact with God. Um, I thought that was an interesting reflection on like Catholic Protestant um, distinctions of religion. Yeah, agreed for sure. That's interesting. Um, cool. So I think Alex, maybe there's like a couple minutes left. Um, but just any, um, I mean, I think that like the one, I mean, we, we did talk about it briefly, but just maybe just maybe a couple points about the wife. Um, I think this whole thing about Protestant Catholic is, is pretty, it's pretty good, but I guess any, anything else there in terms of her character or I guess what I, anyone else? Well, I want to know what, what do you guys think about the naming, um, Obadiah, Elihu, and then his insistence on OE. I think it's basically he was trying to avoid his identity, right? I mean, to some extent, and, it, and it's actually very telling that I mean, he doesn't, he, he basically, he wants to create a new name for himself, right? And I think that that's also something that, I mean, it's, uh, I think it's a key for understanding the text, the importance of the name that is very biblical. And the way it uh, uh, she ends the the story right because she when she I'm opening my text here, but she she says that when he is there he was who called himself Obadiah Elihu leaning against the tree crying like a baby. The moment when he wants to get into the house right that she that he's saying hey open the door for me open the door who are you who are you who are you and then at some point he he pronounces his name, right? And to some extent, it's like him embracing 
who he really is, right? And uh, and 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 not being afraid of basically his his, his real identity, right? Because it seems that I think the entire story is basically he trying to create an identity for himself because he's afraid of his own image, right? Of he he really is. And I think it's amazing that to some extent what God does in his life basically God destroys everything. I mean, it, it turns everything upside down so he can stop lying and he can, and again, I think it's very important that the primacy of grace, right? Because to some extent, it's not that he, uh, have you accepted Jesus? Have you accepted Jesus, right? This is the story. Have you been saved? Have you been saved? As if it were just, I mean, a, a decision that you, and primarily a decision that you make. And I think Flannery O'Connor is uh, is telling us that, say, well, prim primarily is actually, a, is God's decision, right? Is God just uh, I mean, coming to your life like a hurricane, right? And, and, and changing everything. And when he does that, then he, he starts understanding his, his own identity. And I do think the tree, I mean, leaning against the tree, the pecan tree, right? The, in, in front of his house, I think it's an image of the tree of life, right? Of the, the tree of the cross, right? To some extent that he's mm. crying like a baby. He, I think he's going back to, to, to a state of innocence, right? I think that's a... In fact, in, uh, well, you, Alex, probably know more, uh, Alex Hadley, another Brazilian, that, uh, in fact, the crying as a baby, that's really interesting, because at least in the Odyssey, there are three points where there is a tree, the olive tree, and at different, at different points of the story. And on the three trees, he suffers a rebirth. He's born again, and, and he suffers a conversion, the hero. And Odysseus changes, usually through sleep. And then he, and in fact, on one occasion, he wakes up naked uh, after, after a shipwreck. And, and the tree is always there uh, with the hand, uh, like hand to hand with the rebirth, which is also related to Genesis, because it's the tree of life, of the beginning of a, of a new life. So it's a, it's a powerful symbol. Yeah. Um... I thought it was also interesting, like, uh, so he's afraid of his own name. I thought also with, like, the, the prophet name, it's like his name is a calling. Um, especially because his name is so biblical. It's almost like he's ashamed of the fact that his name is biblical, and he doesn't want people to be able to say his biblical name. Because he knows when people call him that, it's like a calling to his real life. Um, that's, a, that's a key idea, actually, in Walker Percy, that the 20th century man has suffered from this crisis of identity, mm -hmm. but that's only because the crisis of identity, uh, that's only because Christianity has been kind of declared obsolete by the elites of the intellectual world. And he, he has this very powerful, powerful parts actually where he kind of offhand actually offers a solution basically where he actually, he, and he calls it the medieval solution. He's kind of like, or we could, you know, we could see ourselves as, uh, created by God, um, inter in interaction with other people, meant to do good to other people and serve God. But oh, that you know, we've kind of done away with that. So I guess we can't really rely on that anymore. So instead, we have to come up with all these new ways of self-identifying. And it strikes me like, yeah, when people are actually able to call him by his real name, it's like this is a calling to be an actually good person. He also he he's terrified of other people knowing his name. Um, they any I thought this was really interesting. The only people that know his name are the Navy, the government, and on his baptismal record. And on the very previous line, he said, um, "Long views, long sorry, previous page, long views depressed Parker. You look out into space like that, and you begin to feel as if someone were after you, the Navy or the government or religion, which are exactly <laughs> the three things of the people that know his name. So like I said, it's like a calling. Like if somebody knows your name, they they have the ability to call you. And then the Jonah imagery later." You know, God speaks to Jonah. Jonah, Jonah. You know. He has a mission for him, and Jonah refuses. Um, I thought that was really interesting. Like, yeah, this is calling. Like, Justin, did you say that we have to go? Because I have one thing that I wanted to share with you guys. Yeah, one last thing, man, for sure. 
Okay. The, just one thing maybe for reading Flannery O'Connor in general, and I think I talked to Daniel about this, was um, like why is it so weird and strange then it, it often ends with a, a strange act of violence or just a weird act, but often with violence. Um, so this story ends with the beating of him. No, uh, a good man's hard to find ends with like a five people get murdered. Um, I was just thinking about other stories that I've read recently. Wait, what was the one I was just thinking of? Oh, there's a great one about this uh, old lady called Greenfield and ends with her getting uh, gored by a bull. Um, it's like, what the heck is going on with these stories? And that may sound like it doesn't make sense. And honestly, it doesn't really make sense in the context of the story either. Except there's this one part in Walker Percy where he talks about the dilemma of the Christian novelists. Um, another good thing I like about them is that they don't, like in a way they're not Christian novelists, but also they totally are. And he gives a really good explanation of why that is. He's like, look, a novelist is just trying to write about like the true nature of mankind and his place in the world. And it has to be informed by my religion because my religion tells me what I think about the world. <laughs> um, but he has this line where he says, okay, the American Christian novelist faces a peculiar dilemma today. Um, his dilemma is that though he professes a belief which he holds, saves himself and the world and nourishes his art besides, it is also true that Christendom seems in some sense to have failed. Its vocabulary is worn out. This twin failure raises problems for a man who is Christian and his trade is with words. The old words of grace are worn smooth as poker chips and a certain devaluation has occurred, like a poker chip after is cashed in. Um, even if one talks only of Christendom, leaving the heathens out of it, and of, of Christendom where everybody is a believer, it almost seems that when everybody believes in God, it is as if everybody started the game with one poker chip, and that is the same as starting with none. So this whole problem of like, you can use words that before were important, and now nobody recognizes their value. And then he has kind of a solution. Um, sorry, actually, then he, yeah. Oh, yeah. He does the one only thing he can do. This is what a Christian novelist should do. Um, he calls on every ounce of cunning, craft, and guile he can muster from the darker regions of his soul. The fictional use of violence, shock, comedy, insult, the bizarre are the everyday tools of his trade. How could it be otherwise? How can one possibly write a baptism as an event of immense significance when baptism is already accepted, but accepted by and large as a minor tribal right, somewhat secondary in importance to taking the kids to see Santa at the department store? Flannery O'Connor conveyed baptism through its exaggeration in one novel as a violent death by drowning. Um, in answer to the question about why she created such bizarre characters, she replied that for the near blind, you have to draw very large, simple caricatures. I thought it was helpful to see like why is she using such bizarre violence. This image of like, yeah, the the images that we've been using is like a burning bush image. Never mind what I because I think that's a burning that it's a burning bush image, or even like saying the name Yahweh. It's like it's not good enough anymore for people. People don't get it, and I think that especially about baptism. I teach religion still, and like teaching the sacraments is very weird to me because kids all know what's going on. Like they, they know what baptism is, but it's hard to like explain how it's a big deal just because whatever, it's what we all do. Um, and so instead they kind of introduce these concepts in very weird ways. So the same thing with like, yeah, instead of using a burning bush image, you have this burning tree. Instead of using Yahweh, you have him blaspheming all the time. And then the one moment when he kind of blasphemes in the burning bush moment, it's like he actually is encountering God. Um, I thought it was helpful for reading her in general, explaining why she's. I agree, agree, man. I think that's actually very helpful, for sure. What's the name of the the the, the title of this book that you were reading now? Uh, the message in the bottle. Okay. The Walker Percy. Mm -hmm. It's a book of essays. Um, that chapter you might actually be able to find on the internet. I'm not sure. The chapter I would recommend it for everybody. It, it's it's called a novel about the end of the world. It's kind of his explanation of, I don't know exactly how to express it, but it's kind of like what his goal as a Christian novelist is and that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah.
Cool. Well, great. Thank you so much, Alex. I think we have to go, but that was, that was awesome. I think that everyone, especially Rafa, has a much better understanding now of, of these stories, <laughs> or at least what you're trying to get at. Um, so thank you uh, for, for, for coming on, man.